Good morning to all. When I last talked at this meeting, half of you had not been born. Now, if you ask people what is the biggest problem in the world today, many of the replies will say that climate change is the biggest problem. I don't think that is true. The biggest problem facing the world is poor thinking. Now that seems rather strange because obviously our thinking is very good. We can land people on the moon. In fact, Buzz Aldrin is a good friend of mine. We can have a wonderful internet. We can fly faster than the speed of sound. We can cure many illnesses. So how can it be poor thinking? Well, I'll explain why. When Greek thinking came into Europe at the time of the Renaissance, schools, universities and thinking were in the hands of the church, the Catholic Church. Now the church did not need creative thinking, did not need design thinking, did not need perceptual thinking. What the church did need was truth, logic, and argument with which to prove heretics wrong. So we developed a very good thinking culture based on truth, logic, and argument. And that thinking culture has done us very well in science and technology. but not at all in human affairs. Human affairs have changed very, very little. In fact, it was even worse than that because with the church, your thinking started with fixed points, dogma, beliefs, God is omnipotent and so on. And if you start with fixed points, logic is sufficient to reach an answer if you start with fixed points. But in real life, you do not start with fixed points. You start with perceptions. And research at Harvard by a colleague of mine, David Perkins, shows that 90% of the errors in thinking are errors of perception. Only 10% are errors of logic. But on the whole, we've neglected perception because, as I say, the time of the church if you start with fixed points, perception was unimportant. So our thinking is not nearly as good as we believe it to be. And that, to my mind, is the biggest problem in the world today. When you have thinking that is in search of the truth, then judgment is very important. When you have thinking that is seeking to create value, then you need design. Very important aspect of thinking. Design is putting together what you have to deliver the values you want. And almost completely neglected in education, outside specific design courses. In my view, every child in school, every week should have a design project. Very, very key. I'll give you an example, political example. If we take the recent problem between Gaza and Israel and so on, the natural response is judgment. They are bad guys, they're firing rockets at us, we must bomb them. Okay. Design approach would be a little different. Design approach would be that all the countries which set up Israel in the first place should jointly pay the Palestinians a grant of $3 billion a year, but every time they fired a rocket at Israel, they lose $50 million. 
Now the whole scene has changed and the thinking has changed and the hardliners become a nuisances rather than heroes. Design, very key, very neglected in all thinking and especially in international affairs. It's often even worse than that because in democracies worldwide, there are certain professions who don't really want to go into politics. Engineers, architects, scientists, executives, and so on. Why? Because if you're not elected the second time, you can't go back to where you were. So politics tends to be full of the talking people, lawyers, journalists, teachers, people who are very, very good at talking, but have never done any constructive thinking in their lives. And that is a real problem, that is a real problem. So our thinking is excellent, but not enough. Some time ago, difficult separating these sheets out. Some time ago, I invented a new word in the English language, and the new word is Ebna. Ebna means excellent, but not enough. And there's a need for that word because it's not correct sometimes to say that something's wrong or bad when it is not wrong or bad. We need a way of saying that is excellent but not enough. And our existing thinking is Ebner. It is excellent but not enough. We do not have enough of the design aspect, the creative aspect in our thinking. I believe, for example, all governments should have a minister of thinking and that minister would look at the thinking involved in different areas and so on. And then there's another big project I'm working on, which is that many years ago at the United Nations, I tried to set up a group to provide some additional thinking, some new ideas, new alternatives. I had many meetings. Kofi Annan, when he was Secretary General, was at some of the meetings. It proved impossible because they said, we are not here to think. We're here to represent our countries, not to think. And on that basis, you're never going to get any new thinking from the United Nations. So one of my projects is to set up somewhere in the world, maybe it could be in Holland, a palace of thinking, which would have two functions. One is to receive and collect ideas from anywhere and to promote and publish the best ones. And the other is to organize creative meetings to look at world issues like immigration, drugs, and so on and so on. So that's a project which I'm going to set up. Give an example of ideas. One time I was in Delhi, India, giving a seminar. And at the end, a young fellow came up to me he said, I have a new, he had a new idea for democracy. He said, if you have children, you should have one extra vote, if you have children. Why? Because if you don't have children, you are not very committed to the future. If you're 50 years old, no children, you don't care about things like climate change, because it's going to last your lifetime, why do you care? But if you have children, you have a commitment to the future. So it's an interesting idea. If you have children, you have one extra vote, and so you're more concerned about the future than people without children. So Palace of Thinking is a project which I intend to do within the next year or so. Now, lateral thinking is one of the aspects of the thinking we need. It's to do with creativity. There's a mathematical need for creativity. Why? Because time passes, information comes in, we build on what we've got. But there comes a point where when the information comes in, you can completely change, restructure, reconceptualize what you've got. There's a mathematical need for creativity. How does creativity happen? Well, one day a fellow gets up in the morning and he says he has 11 pieces of clothing to put on And how many ways could he get dressed? 
He programs his IBM computer to go through all the ways of getting dressed with 11 pieces of clothing. The computer took 40 hours of non-stop processing. The reason is, with 11 pieces of clothing, you actually have 39,916,800 ways of getting dressed. It's 11 times 10 times 9 times so on. I'll give you that figure. If you had to try one way every minute of your life, of your waking life, you would need to live to be 76 years old, doing nothing else your whole life except trying ways of getting dressed. <laughs> now, that would not be very convenient. Fortunately for us, the brain is designed specifically to allow incoming information to organize itself into routine patterns. That is the purpose of the brain. Once we have the patterns, all we need to do is identify which pattern and use it. How the brain does that, how the neurons do that, I wrote up in 1969 in a book called The Mechanism of Mind, how the neurons do that. That book was read by the leading physicist in the world, Professor Mario Gell-Mann, who got his Nobel Prize for the quark, very enthusiastic. He commissioned a team of top computer experts to simulate what I said in the book, and they said, yes, it works exactly as you predict. And he's been a great supporter ever since. Now, what happens in patterning systems is they are always asymmetric. What does that mean? Well, the definition of a pattern is if you're point A, you have a greater chance of going to point B than anywhere else. We can imagine that like being on a track. You're much more likely to walk along the track than to go off the side. But all patterning systems are asymmetric. What does that mean? It means you can go from C to A, but not from A to C. That's asymmetry of patterns. All patterns are asymmetric. Now that gives rise to two phenomena in the human brain, one of which is humor. Humor is by far the most significant behavior of the human brain, far more significant than reason. Not more important, more significant, because humor indicates an asymmetric patterning system. What happens in humor? You're going along, you're taken there, and in hindsight, perfectly logical. I'll give you a very simple example. A 90-year-old man dies, goes down to hell. As he's wandering around, he sees a friend of his, also aged 90, sitting there with a beautiful young girl sitting on his knee. So he says to his friend, he says, are you sure this is hell? Because you seem to be having rather a good time. The man looks up and said, no, he said, it's hell all right. He said, I am the punishment for her. <laughs> Abs absolutely logical, absolutely logical. Now, I always have to tell one blonde joke in all my talks. I tell a blonde joke. And there's a blonde wife who's very annoyed with her husband. She picks up a gun, puts it to her head. Her husband starts laughing. She tells him, she says, I wouldn't laugh if I were you. You're next. Now, creativity has the same basis as humor. We're going along the main track, and we want to move laterally to a side track. There's not just one side track, there may be many. And that's where the term lateral comes from, making that movement. And there are some specific techniques, I'll have to mention them very, very briefly. One of them is challenge. Challenge means we put a stop on this, and as a result of that, start looking in other directions. Very simple example, 1970 or earlier, I forget, I was doing some work for Shell Oil in London, and I said, when you drill an oil well, I'll just when you drill an oil well, you drill it straight down and have done for 80 years. I said, let's challenge that. Why not drill your oil well like that? They said, we can't do it because the drill won't go around the corner. I said, yes, it will. If you use a hydraulic head, you pull it around. <laughs>
Today, almost every oil well is drilled like that because you get between three and six times as much oil from this oil well as from that. But for 80 years, people were happy with that. No problem, didn't need thinking about it. In fact, Statoil in Norway has one well going 10 kilometers horizontally. The reason it's very successful, of course, is that if this is the oil-bearing stratum, here you just go through, here you're exposed for a long time. Very simple, very logical. So that's one of the processes, challenge. Then there's another one. And this time we're going along. And we go back and we say, what is the concept behind this? Let's identify the concept and find other ways of delivering the concept. So one time in Australia, the mayor of a small town came to see me and he said, we have a problem with commuters. They drive into the town, they leave their cars parked in the street all day and so people can't find anywhere to park in order to shop. Should we put in parking meters? It's expensive to put them in, expensive to maintain them. I said, what is the concept behind a parking meter? That you want people to be aware, conscious, to know that their time is limited being parked. I said, well, if that's the concept, we could do it another way. You could park anywhere you like for as long as you like, provided you left your headlights full on. <laughs> now, you're not going to leave your car there for one minute longer than you need to because you're running your battery flat. So all you do in certain parts of the town, you have a little notice saying, only headlight parking here. <laughs> and that's much cheaper than putting in parking meters. So concept extraction is another process. Then there's provocation. Provocation means putting in a stepping stone. I invented the word po, meaning provocation. And then you use a process <coughs> called movement. You move there, once you're there, totally logical. Now, logicians get very, very upset with provocation. Because in logic, you start and you take a series of steps, each of which is correct, and you get a correct answer. Provocation, you move to an idea which may be totally wrong, and you move forward. Now, interestingly, mathematicians are on my side. Mathematicians say, if you have a self-organizing system, like the human brain, such systems reach what's called a local equilibrium. And unless you provoke it, you're never going to get the global equilibrium. They use the term annealing. When you make steel, you cool it down. The crystals lock in a position which is stable but not very strong. So you have to keep reheating it, reheating it, reheating it, until they stay in a position which is stable but much stronger. So provocation is essential in any self-organizing system. I'll give you a couple of examples. One time I was in California. I was talking to the whole ecology department and they said we have a problem with rivers. People build factories on the river. They put out their pollution. People downstream suffer. So as a provocation, I said, Po, the factory is downstream of itself. Now that sounds pretty impossible. How can the factory be at A and B at the same time? From it comes a very, very simple idea, which has now become legislation in 13 countries, which is that normally you take in your water, you put out your pollution. We legislate that if you build a factory on the river, your input has to be downstream of your own output. So you're the first to get your pollution. <laughs> That's now become legislation in 13 countries. So why does it take 50 years to think of that? Well, it's provocation makes sense. I'll give you another one, which is very strange. I was talking to senior Boeing engineers, the aircraft people, and as a provocation, I said, Poe, airplane should land upside down. Now you can imagine that's not very attractive to an aeronautical engineer. But if planes land upside down, the wings give you downward thrust. 
from that comes a very interesting idea. We have a normal plane, normal wings, but then we have two small wings upside down. These give you some downward thrust. So now we have a negative bias. If we need extra lift in an emergency, we cancel that by retracting it or rotating it, and instantly we get extra lift. Now since 70% of plane crashes are caused by the inability to switch on lift, they're very interested in it, they're looking into it, if it can be made practical and so on. So starting with an idea which sounds really extraordinary, ending up with a very sound one. I'll give you one more example. And this was a fellow who was head of Prudential Insurance in Canada, and he was very keen on my work and used the processes. And in life insurance, you have a life insurance policy, and when you die, the company pays out to your family or other beneficiaries. So one day he says to himself, Poe, you die before you die. That sounds pretty daft. How can you die before you die? As a result of that, put in a system where if you got a serious illness, they would immediately pay 75% of the death benefits. The other 25% when you did die. That's been extremely successful, because now you have money to pay for hospitals and so on. It's called living needs benefits. It's now been used by virtually every insurance company in North America. And that is changing an idea which had been the same for 123 years. So provocation is one of the processes of lateral thinking. Then there's another process, which is very, very simple. Normally we start our thinking and we go along that. If you start your thinking somewhere else, you increase the chance of hitting that track straight off. And the history of science is full of examples where important ideas were triggered by random events, like the apple falling on Newton's head in the orchard and so on. Now, how do we get that point? You can't choose it because it would lie along your normal thinking. So we use chance, a chance starting point. And the easiest is a random word. And nouns are easiest to use. One time in South Africa, one of my trainers was working for a steel company. And one afternoon, she set up a workshop. And just using the random word technique, that afternoon, they generated 21,000 new ideas. Just in one afternoon, using the random word technique. Very, very simple, very powerful. So there are things we can do. There's one more thing I'm going to mention before I stop and we'll have a question time, which is that argument is an extremely primitive and inefficient way of exploring the subject. It's negative, there's no design, there's fixed positions, and there's far too much ego. So instead of that, many years ago, I designed parallel thinking. Parallel thinking means that instead of A arguing with B, A and B are both looking in the same direction, but the directions change. And to indicate the directions change, we have the symbol of the thinking hat, that as you sit thinking, there are six different hats you can put on which will indicate the mode of thinking. And at that moment, everyone is looking in the same direction. There's a white hat for information, the red hat for emotions, intuition, the black hat for critical thinking, the yellow hat for value thinking, the green hat for creativity, and the blue hat to organize everything. Now, very, very widely used. Last year, I was told by a Nobel Prize economist, he said the previous week, I think it was Joe Stiglitz, the previous week had been in Washington at the top economics meeting in the United States. They were using my six hats method there.
then uh, one of my colleagues in New York was teaching the six hats to juries in law courts and using the hats they reached unanimous decisions very very quickly the judges were so impressed that in at least three states the judge can now ask that the jury be trained in the six hats that's the first change in the jury system for 1,000 years argument is an extremely primitive form of examining a subject now what's interesting at first sight the six hats may seem complicated and take a lot of time in fact it's the opposite ABB in Finland used to spend 30 days on their multinational project discussions using the hats they do it in two days JP Morgan the finance house in Europe found they reduced meetings to one tenth of what time they were because argument people just finding little points to show how smart they are I think argument was invented by wealthy middle-class Greeks who had a big lunch didn't have to work in the afternoon wanted some way of occupying the afternoon and proving they were smarter than their neighbors so they invented argument which we've used ever since and it's a very inefficient way of exploring a subject there are times when it may be correct but in general it's not a good way of exploring the subject what happens with the hats people are expected to perform so if the green hat is in use and you don't feel creative either you make an effort to be creative or you keep quiet people don't like keeping quiet so they make an effort there's also a physiological reason for it imagine you have a, an antelope in Africa grazing and there's a noise on the grass immediately there's a chemical released in the brain in the hypothalamus which sensitizes all the nerve circuits concerned with running away so as soon as the lion appears the antelope runs away on the other hand in the lion's brain as soon as it sees its possible lunch there's a chemical released which sensitizes all the nerve circuits concerned in getting your lunch so there are background chemicals in the brain which sensitize according to the mood and if we try and do everything at once we get confusion or just end up with a negative by allocating specific times to each we can as it were get a fuller use of the brain the method is used now by four-year-olds in school by top executives and some of the world's major companies so we have to ask why were we content with argument for 2400 years indeed for 2400 years we've done extremely little about operational thinking Descriptions, yes, descriptions, analysis, but very little operational thinking.